Good morning, everyone. It's good to see some new faces joining us for our worship service today. Uh, it's always a joy to gather together as God's people to sing his praises, to listen to his word being preached. Um, you know, I, I thought and prayed about what the message would be this week uh, and some different things kind of aligned uh, where I felt like this truly is a message that God wants to give to us in the time that we are in now. Uh, some of you might have noticed, uh, but this is a, an election year. Okay, oh, I, I say the word election already, I see people's eyes perk up. Uh, where is this going? Uh, for those of you who are worried that I'm going to preach a sermon that you need to lean left or right or middle or whatever it might be, please do not worry. I can promise you that you'll never hear me backing some candidate, okay? I'm here because I have a calling to preach truth, to preach the word of God, to preach Christ Jesus alone from the pulpit, to preach his name and no other name. And so as I preach his truth, as I preach the gospel on a weekly basis, the reality is that if it's just the gospel and we hear it and we separate that from every other part of our lives, then we can kind of compartmentalize and say, okay, well, I've done the church thing for, for the week, and now I go out into the real world, and then I do my work stuff, I do my family stuff, and I do the politics stuff, and I do, right, like we can kind of separate everything out. But if there's something that I hope has become so evident every week as we hear the word of God be preached, is that the word of God must, in fact, inform every area of our lives. Jesus is the only one who can offer forgiveness, salvation, new and eternal life. So I'm not here to preach politics from the pulpit, but I'm here to preach about what it means to be a faithful believer of God and what that means to actually interact in different spaces in the world that we live in, and how we can do that faithfully, and how we ought to look at it, and from what perspective we must take those things. So the word of God, biblical principles, must and should inform your politics in whichever way you lean, whether you vote right or left or don't vote at all. And so my hope is that through today's psalm, that we will revisit today, Psalm 146, I've spoken on before, but as we revisit it today, I hope that we'll be reminded there's only one true perfect leader, and that we know is Jesus Christ, that we know is our Lord and Savior, our God, whom we just sang songs about, songs of praise to, the only one worthy of our total devotion and allegiance, our God. And so we're gonna look at the word of God in Psalm 146, and this is what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear God, we just pray that you would open up our hearts and just open up our minds to hear your word for us today. God, would you challenge us Encourage us, help us with your power to view the world and everything in it, to view our own lives in the right perspective through your word. 
Help us know what it means to be faithful to you in every area of our lives. God, when you gave us a new life, you gave us a new purpose. And so help us to live that out faithfully as you have called us to do. We thank you for this worship service where you are honored and glorified. You alone are deserving of all the honor and glory and praise. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get to the main points of today's message, I want to reread one more time that verse 1 and 2. It's a, it starts with, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Now we've gone over some of the Psalms over the past few weeks. Remember, remember again with me always that the Psalms, though many of us like to use the Psalms as our individual times of devotion, it had a purpose within the community and the people of God. The Psalms, the collections of songs and writings, remember again, the Israelite people come together and they worship God and fellowship together over the words and songs. Now why did they do this? the same reason we continue to gather, they needed a reminder of their purpose as God's people, just as we often do. They needed to be reminded that they are not alone, but that there's a community that God has blessed them with, blessed us with. And so often we need reminders of the truth that we should indeed praise the Lord. The truth that we indeed should go to God every day thankful for all that he has given to us. And so he starts, the psalmist starts by saying, praise the Lord. And there's almost like a response immediately after that when someone says praise the Lord, you kind of have an, a, an opportunity to respond. You can either say, praise the Lord, why would I do that? Have you seen the things that I'm going through in my life? That's one response that you could have. Or you could have the response that we see the psalmist write out for us here. Someone says, praise the Lord. The response, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Because if we're being honest with ourselves and one another, we don't always feel like praising God, do we? Maybe you're here this morning and you hear the songs being sung and maybe you kind of sing along a little bit, but in your heart or in your feeling, you're like, I'm not really feeling like praising God this morning. There's so many reasons, I think, in our lives that we can look for reasons to not want to praise God. Simply having a bad day might cause us to not want to praise God. A fight with our husband or, or wife might cause us to not want to praise God. Dealing with disobedient children who are frustrating us or maybe not doing well in school, whatever it might be, might want, make us not want to praise God. A boss, a coworker that's making our workplace miserable might cause us to not want to praise God. A medical diagnosis, a tragedy, a tragic accident, there's so many reasons that we can come up with to not want to praise God. Circumstances, hardships come in life. But as his people, as we gather together, it's in light of any of the circumstances of life that may be ahead of us, in front of us, around us, currently we're in it right now, we can say, praise the Lord, and then we have the response, and we're actually telling our souls, telling ourselves, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I wonder how many of us need to do that more often. When we don't feel like praising the Lord, we know who God is. We believe in who he is. We have a new life in him. And so we tell our souls, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, because I know that he is worthy to be praised. Amen? So that's what we do. We say, praise the Lord, and then we respond, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I know that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what it looks like in the world around us, the climate of culture and all the things that could possibly go wrong, I know who God is. So no matter what I may be going through, no matter what may be going on in the world around me, I can say, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And saying that together as the people of God, being reminded that we're not alone in it, it's such an encouragement. 
That's why God has given to us the church, the community of believers, the fellowship to, to understand that we do follow the one true God. And as we'll see, he is the perfect leader. So I'm going to kind of contrast the earthly leader, leaders in this world, and then the heavenly leader, which is our God. So we're going to start first with the earthly leader, and I've kind of titled the, the earthly leader Power for Self. So we'll get into that together. Verses 3 to 4 of this psalm says, Put not your trust in princes in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. So people, I believe, are always looking for someone to look up to. Whether we agree to it or not, or we believe it or not, I really believe that from a young age, we're looking to someone to lead us, someone that we can follow. You look at social media, it's right there. How many followers do you have? How many people do you have influence or some kind of authority over? Whether we want to call influencers leaders or not, they really are in many ways, especially in the way that they have influence over the younger generation. Hours and hours of scrolling through different social media reels and TikToks and all kinds of things, giving all kinds of information and dispersing knowledge, whether it's true or not, there's a lot of influence and authority, leadership actually that takes place in that space. So as a side note, if you have young children, please know what they are looking at or listening to online and in social media because it has a profound effect on actually leading them one way or the other. And my hope and prayer always for every single person in our church and for the body of Christ is that we would follow not anyone who is of this world, but that we would follow Jesus Christ, the heavenly leader, the perfect leader. Simply put, <clears throat> leaders in this world, earthly leaders, will always have some kind of promise to you that if you just follow me, if you just give me your allegiance, then there's something in it for you. I'm going to hook you up with something that you really want. I'm going to give you something that your heart desires. So follow me, and I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to give you back something. So just follow me. Trust me. Come with me. Follow along with me. And whether it's explicitly or implicitly, there's always some kind of a promise that there's something in it for you. And so it's interesting that in God's word for us today, after giving praise to the Lord, the psalmist in the next lines immediately says, do not trust in princes or a son of man. And that word man is Adama in Hebrew. And what that means actually is just man in general, like that you came from the dust, earth. And so he's saying, don't trust in someone who's come from the earth. Why? Because on the day he breathes his last breath, he returns to the earth from which he came. And any plans that he might have been pursuing or trying to accomplish comes to an end. And there are so many earthly leaders, and here it says princes, they are the people who are in positions of power, who probably have money and backing who have power and influence, and they are the ones, if you ask them to do something, they might actually have the resources to make it happen, and yet it still says, do not trust them. It means don't devote yourself, don't put your complete trust in the princes of this world. You see, what any worldly leader is able to give you is only temporary. And it is so often intertwined with a holding on to of power for themselves. So yes, they offer you something, but they say, follow me, trust me, so that I can retain or grow in my own power. There's a power play in earthly leadership. Somehow trying to gain power for self. Now think of all the kings, even of Israel. This, these are people who were supposed to lead God's people towards him, to show his character and righteousness and justice and love. But think about all the kings that are named that were so bad. Kings of Israel, kings of the people of God. And so you see 
that so many people, earthly leaders, there is simply none that you can fully put your hope and trust in. And why? Because from earth to, and dust they came, and to earth and dust they shall return. Temporary. Even the things that they offer you, temporary. Now, when we think of modern-day princes, there are actually modern-day princes and kings of different nations. But here in the United States, we think often of the president of the United States that fits the bill of someone who has power and influence. And so often, we hear politicians and candidates making all sorts of promises that if you vote for them, they're going to change your life. If you vote for them, then everything is going to turn out better than it was previously. But all of us know that so often there are promises that are not kept. And what was it all for? It was all a means to gain more power, to get your vote, to say, hey, come with me and I'm going to hook you up with something that your heart desires. The saddest thing that I've seen over the course of probably the last four, eight years, ten years, is that families and friendships and even churches, there has become such a polarization and a prioritization of politics that I've seen relationships absolutely broken apart. Simply because one person has put their full allegiance to one person or side, and the other person has put their full allegiance to the other person or side, candidates, parties. And there's just no room for that in the body of Christ. We follow Jesus, no other name. Any other prince of the earth, candidate that you're putting your full trust in, that they have some kind of salvation for you in your life. Now, you might not think that they're going to give you eternal salvation, but in the way that you live your life, are you putting your full trust in a prince of this earth? No man or woman. You can't do it. There's only one perfect leader, a heavenly leader, and that is God alone. In our church, I know that we have varying positions on different policies and, and candidates and, and, and politics. And yes, we don't really talk about it. And maybe sometimes that's a good thing because things have become so polarized and I kid you not, I talked to the pastor and I said, you know what, I, I'm considering having like an, an open table discussion in our church. And maybe people who lean more right and lean more left, we can come together and just talk about why we are supporting one side or the other. And you know what they said? And these are men much older and wiser beyond my years in ministry. They said, you know what, Josh, that's a great heart, but I'm not so sure that's a good idea. And that, in that moment, I kind of thought about it, I was like, Whew. That just shows the state of the hearts of the community of God. That there's something that's gone awry. That our hearts or our allegiance, our devotion has, has kind of become a little bit too strong into an earthly leader or position of power. And I pray that we would never become like that, and that we never be like that here, that we would not see families broken apart, friendships ending, churches splitting. Because there is a polarization and, and, and there's so much being pushed and shoved down our throats that you have to fully go this way or fully go that way or, or whatever it might be. But we must not put our trust in princes, in a son of man whom there is, what does it say? No salvation, no political leanings or relationships take precedence over our relationship with God. None of that identity takes precedence priority over our identity in Christ Jesus for those of us who are saved. There is no salvation in a son of man, period. There's no salvation in one candidate or the other or one party or the other. But there is the son of man who came and seek to save the lost. There is the son of man, Jesus Christ, who came to offer what the world and its leaders could never offer, true salvation. And it's only God who can give us that. It's only God whom we can trust in for that. So what does that mean for us, especially in this election year? If we're not putting our trust in any earthly leader, does that mean that we shouldn't participate in politics at all? Well, what I believe is that God still wants for us to 
do our part in being prayerful for our nation, praying for the leaders who are already in power, praying for the leaders who will be in power, whoever that may be, but we have to be faithful as citizens of the United States of America, for those of us who are, and also putting first priority that we are ultimately kingdom citizens of God's kingdom, and that he is our ultimate leader that we put our hope and trust in. So we faithfully follow, follow our perfect leader, our God, even in the political arena. We should pray. We should look into policies and ask God for wisdom and discernment in voting for a particular candidate. And after researching, praying, reflecting, make a decision with a clear conscience before God, whether you vote for this candidate or this candidate or no candidate at all, but that you've done a due diligence to actually interact with this, yes, important area of our lives that God has given to us. So don't put your full trust in any man or woman on this earth. No matter what promises they give you, there's only one who can give you the promise of eternity, something that's not temporary and just to build up or keep power for self, and that we're going to talk about is the heavenly leader. Remember that there's no earthly leader that can save you or this world. They cannot give you all the desires and all the things and ideals that you have in your mind and in your heart. God is in control, and he reigns. And that's what we're going to talk about in the second point, the heavenly leader. And this part I titled Power for the Powerless. Power for the Powerless. Let's start with verses 5 and 6. It says, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Now, this is a direct contrast from the princes of the earth, and then now we're talking about the heavenly leader, God himself. Remember, man, from dust, from the earth he came, and to the earth he will return, and yet our heavenly leader, God, he is actually the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. It immediately is trying to tell us, look, when I tell you don't put your trust in the princes of man, and the princes of this world, this is reason number one, because we have a king, we have a creator, we have a leader who just needs you to turn to him and put your hope and your trust in him because he's the creator of the world and everything in it, and he is one who keeps faith forever. There's eternal significance. It's not just a temporal leadership. It is a forever reigning in the world, that no matter what happens and what leaders come and go, ultimately that God is the one who will reign forever. And look what it says about who God is. Verse 7, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the sojourners, he upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. So the psalmist begins to describe this heavenly leader, describe the Lord who is, who is worthy of our praise, and there is this character of God that brings love and justice together. Love and justice. It says he executes justice for the oppressed, and he helps those who are in a place of powerlessness. The prisoners, the blind, the ones who are low, the ones who are sojourners, outsiders, the widows, the orphans. These are groups that were often looked down upon in society, not valued, not given any real power or say. In fact, much of the earthly leaders and powers didn't really care for the lowly and the powerless because what could they bring to the table for them to stay in power? Really nothing in terms of what the world has to offer. You don't have money to offer me and my campaign and my leading and my, then I don't have really time for you. What, what can you possibly give to me? And very often, maybe even as it is now, they instead help those who were already in power, those who were already wealthy, 
because they had something to offer them. There's literally jobs in our country that's called a lobbyist, and all they literally do is throw their influence and wait around and say, hey, look, you better listen to us because we have something to offer you. Now, are you going to give us what we want? Because we have a lot of people and a lot of money backing us. Even the gods of the ancient Near East and the Greek gods, there was always a leaning towards helping those who were already elite, already have positions of status and power, something to offer in this world. But the heavenly leader, our God, our Lord, is one who cares deeply for the powerless. His power is for the powerless, and he uses his power to help those who cannot help themselves. Now, maybe you've heard this very unbiblical phrase in your day, God helps those who help themselves. Who here has heard that before? Man, what an unbiblical phrase. God only helps you if you help yourself. It's like, uh, have you heard of the gospel of grace? You, in fact, cannot do anything for yourself. You need God in every instance of your life. So he is giving power to the powerless. He is giving a voice to those who do not have a voice. This is our God who brings power for the powerless. And it's not just power, but there's compassion. Look at the people who he deeply cares for. You see, he's not using the weak in any way to gain for himself. He already is God in a position of utmost authority, and yet he looks at the powerless and he says, I love them, and I have something remarkable for them that I'm going to set the blind man to be able to see, that those who are prisoners in, in this world, wrapped up in their their sin and guilt and shame, I'm going to free them. Those who are oppressed, I'm going to uplift them and, and take away their burden. To the widow, to the fatherless, I'm going to be their heavenly father. The church is going to be my bride. This is the heavenly leader who is the perfect leader. There's such a contrast there, isn't, isn't there, between the earthly leader and the heavenly leader are God. And so we trust in him. I think we should seek to become leaders ourselves, though we will never be perfect, that we ought to have the heart of the heavenly leader, the heart of the one who has made us new. And when we become part of the people of God, as they hear these things being sung over one another in this psalm, there's a challenge that, Am I living my life in that kind of way? In every arena of my life, am I living in such a way where I'm reflecting the heart of the perfect leader, our heavenly Father? Know that in all we do, we follow our Lord and we trust in his power to do all that we or any human leader could never do. And we know that he made good on his promises, that there is no salvation in an earthly leader, but the salvation that God promises to those who place their faith in him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, indeed, we have eternal salvation. Amen? And so if that's you and you are part of the people of God, yes, we take part in the different arenas of life that God has given to us in our careers, our workplace, our family. Yes, in politics, but our ultimate leader that we follow is God. He alone is the one who's worthy of our complete allegiance and devotion. If there's any part of you, I've heard people say this, if you could possibly vote for this party, then you are not a Christian. If you possibly vote for this party, then you are not a Christian. And I'm like, what are we doing here? We're elevating political candidates and earthly leaders above the allegiance that we have for Christ Jesus our Lord. And we cannot do that as the people of God. Jesus Christ is the name that we lift up and glorify. There's no salvation in any other name but Christ Jesus. So the heavenly leader, power for the powerless. 
He cares deeply. He has compassion. And I think about how this applies to me and others in pastoral ministry as well. If I'm busy planning out the future of the church, but it's all about making my name or, or, or even just our church's name great, about retaining some kind of power or growing in our own influence, then that does not reflect the heart of the heavenly leader, our God. And I ask of God every day that as I serve here as pastor at CCC, that people would see a leadership, his leadership, serving others in my life. That's what the call to pastoral ministry is. It's not to write amazing sermons and have people glowing about how great Sunday worship was. It's about being faithful to the one God, saying, God, you are truly the one that is leading my life. My utmost allegiance and devotion is to you alone. So God, may everyone see that. If the first thing that people know about you is that you vote red or blue, it's probably a problem. That shouldn't be the first thing that people think. They should know God who is in you, God who you follow. So I ask you, God, am I living my life as the heavenly leader did for me? How he served the poor how he counseled the brokenhearted, how he met people in the midst of their sin and offered the grace of Jesus Christ, how he walked with those in need, how he healed the sick and the needy. I hope that we will all reflect the servant leadership of Jesus Christ. And in the end, I know that I can trust in the promises of God, that there's no ulterior motive, there's no chance of it failing, and though the world may go through different worldly leaders every four years or whatever it may be, leaders, princes, presidents, dictators, at the end of it all, it will be God's throne alone who reigns. And so we hold fast to the perfect leader, our heavenly leader, our God, and we put our trust in him. Verse 10 says it perfectly. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Let's pray together. To end, I wanted to close with a prayer that was written out for churches, and I've adapted it a little bit, but especially for those of us in this very, it can be very polarizing and tense time when it comes to the area of, of politics in, our, in the church and family and friendships. So many things being affected. So there's this prayer that I'm going to share with you and I, as, as I pray. Think about the words that, that are being prayed. And let's check our hearts as the people of God, as followers of Jesus. Are we living to make his name great? Have we allowed political agendas, allegiances to come above our utmost allegiance to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the prayer. Lord, we come before you in a time marked by division, fear, and uncertainty. We acknowledge that you are the God of perfect love, a love that casts out fear and is freely given to us. It is from this love that we are called to love others, including our neighbors and even our enemies. Yet often we fall so short of that, and for this we seek your forgiveness. As we enter another political season where divisions seem to deepen, rhetoric intensifies, and the pressure to fully align with a party or candidate increases, God, we ask for your guidance. Help us to be a people, God's people, who are more committed to your love and your kingdom than to any political agenda. May we seek your kingdom and righteousness above all else. God, we recognize that for many, including Christians, partisan identity has become more important than identity in Christ. Too often the two are indistinguishable. Lord, let this not be true of us. Grant us wisdom and discernment as you have promised to those who ask. We are in desperate need of your guidance. 
We also pray for unity, a unity established through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Too many churches and families have been torn apart by political divisions, revealing the depth of political idolatry that may be among us. Yet may we be a people who together discern the times and work out our faith in the realm of politics. Let us not be driven by fear, but by a pursuit of what is good, holy, and righteous. May we engage with society in a way that is led by our faith in Jesus and his love and truth. As we navigate life, and in particular during this election year, help us to be motivated by the love, God's love that casts out fear. May we be a people who pursue truth, righteousness, justice, and holiness in all things. Protect the unity that you have established in Christ, and may our faith shape how we are known and act in every arena of life, including politics. May we be known as a people who bring healing and love and life to a grieving and broken world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.